I'm David Plotz. I'm the editor of Slate. We are partners, along with the New America Foundation and Arizona State University, in a great endeavor called Future Tense, which is a program of uh, articles, live events, papers, discussion, movie screenings around uh, technology and public policy, particularly looking at ways in which technology is going to change our future. It's been a almost two year, I guess, uh, partnership and it's been incredibly interesting and fun for all of us and uh, it gives us a chance to have events like this. So Chris Anderson has an enviable, he has three different enviable careers at least. One is that he is the editor in chief of Wired Magazine, which I think we can just you know, pose as a certainty is one of the great magazines of our time. Uh, he is the author of best-selling books, of course, the, the massive bestseller, The Long Tail, and then this book we're going to talk about today, which is a future bestseller, Makers, uh, The New Industrial Revolution. And he is an entrepreneur who has, um, in kind of world's greatest dad fashion, has created a company, maybe even more than one company, only one, one company? At Just the, one. At the moment. At the moment, one company. Um, uh, taking his sort of his maker skills and building a company that, that uh, does all sorts of things that he's going to tell us about relating to drones and other matters. Um, so we're here to talk about the new industrial revolution, Makers, the New Industrial Revolution, which is a, a, it's a fantastic book. I strongly advise everyone to go out and buy it. Uh, and, uh, or better yet, you could manufacture it yourself <laughs> in your basement if you were really clever. And since, um, since uh, our author doesn't believe that intellectual property can be stolen, you should just steal it and, and manufacture it yourself. And, and good luck to you, right? So um, it seems to me uh, that the one sentence summary of this book is, is uh, uh, bits are, bits of, wait, sorry, atoms are the new bits, not bits are the new atoms, atoms are the new bits. So, so what does that mean? Tell us what that means. Uh, thank you. Good, good question. First of all, I want to, to thank our, our hosts at Microsoft on a big day for, uh, for giving us the space. And I'm, I'm incredibly privileged that uh, you would do this to me. I'm a, I'm a huge fan, constant reader. And anyway, this is a treat. I'm also a DC native, so this is an opportunity to see my mom. Thank you. Um, so anyway, to, an to answer your question, um, this is what happens when the web generation meets the real world. And the web generation refers to a bunch of things, but it's largely it's, you know, what Wired was founded to chronicle, which is how technology changes the world. And it's not about the technology. It's enabled by the technology, but it's basically what happens when you give powerful tools to regular people, and then they end up changing the world. And I think we've seen 20 years of the web and seen what can happen when regular people get powerful tools. Those powerful tools now extend to manufacturing tools. In the same way that, the, you know, that Steve Jobs and Wozniak didn't invent the first computer, but they put the word personal and desktop in front of it. And in it with a very weak and inadequate computer compared to the mainframes of the time, they changed the world. And then when Tim Berners-Lee and others, including Slate and, and, and Wired in the early years, took the uh, communication networks and put them in the hands of regular people through web browsers and the internet, changed the world. Um, we're not, we now have a moment that's really kind of crept up over the past three or four years where things like 3D printers, laser cutters, CNC machines, cheap and easy CAD, services that will do manufacturing for you, that basically all that hard stuff is now just a click away like desktop publishing was 20 years ago. So let's, let's dwell on the 3D printer because I think a lot of us, and I count myself in this crew, they see, you see a 3D printer, it's extruding some plastic doodad, and you're like, it's extruding a plastic doodad. Why is the 3D printer, like tell us, you have a very good riff in the book about why the 3D printer is sort of in its just very embryonic stages and then when it, what's coming is going to sure. dazzle us. So, so what does that mean? Um, first of all, let us not discount that extruding a plastic doodad is kind of amazing just by itself. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you, um, uh, I'll get to my homework assignment later in the conversation, but, um, you know, if you have children, consider what a 3D printer in there in the home might do to their their, their plastic little minds and what they might become as a result of it. Um, but um, this, this, the simple answer is that a, um, uh, you know, think of 1985. 1985, it, Macintosh just came out in 84 and made computing sort of, you had personal computers but they were hard to use and then it became easy to use and then there was a laser writer. 
the, the Apple laser printer. And you know, you could buy it, and it was about $2,500 or so. And um, you could do desktop publishing. Now, I, I realize this does not impress anybody anymore, desktop publishing. But at the time, it was kind of amazing. We came from the publishing industry. And, you know, in those old days, to publish, you needed a printing plant, which is, by the way, a factory, you know, a sort of a, a block-sized you know, factory with ink by the barrel and rolls of paper by the rail cart. And then, you know, it was like desktop publishing. 500 years from Gutenberg on, and now it was like a software, and you press a button, and out came this professional quality stuff. And you're like, amazing, but you know, now what? You know, church newsletters, lost cat flyers, etc. And you know, it was, we made horrible every things. Every cat was found. Every cat was, every cat was found. <laughs> All churches suddenly became much more engaged. Um, and, um, and we made a horrible dog's breakfast of, of you know, mishmash of fonts, and we had to learn language, words like letting and turning and flow and wrap around. And, and it didn't really change the world yet, but you planted the seed, and then along came the web, and then publish turned into a button on your web browser. And I mean, just every time, if, for those of you who, you who still have blogs, I realize it's, we're, we're, being, we're being curmudgeonly blogs. Um, but you know, when you press publish on your, on your blog, you just basically turned you know, a half millennia worth of industrial knowledge into a single click. And, and, that, was, and that was awesome. But it started with a laser you know, printer on your desktop, and then that became an inkjet printer on your desktop. And today we all have one. And by the way, the killer app turned out not to be church newsletters, but instead digital cameras and printing out you know, high resolution cameras. And, 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 and now we get it. Public, we democratize publishing, and, and we all have a voice, and we can reach the world. Um, the 3D printer is kind of right where that first laser writer is, which is it is now possible to have a 3D printer on your desktop. Now, uh, just to, to really quickly walk into what a 3D printer is, um, you know how a, a 2D printer, like a like a your inkjet, takes pixels on the screen and turns them into drops of ink on, on paper. So it turns bits into atoms in a sense. And it just kind of a head moves around, and lays it down. Now imagine that head just kept going, laying layer upon layer upon layer. And it wasn't ink, it was something else, initially plastic, but over but but, but other, other materials. You would then build up an object layer by layer until you until you had it. Um, today you can buy a printer that uh, costs between thirteen hundred and twenty three hundred dollars. It will do just that. Um, starting plastic, or you can upload it to a service like Shapeways and have that same object, which you just, by the way, designed on screen in like 20 minutes. It's not hard anymore. Um, and you can have it made in titanium, stainless steel, um, bronze, uh, glasses of various sorts, any kind of resins. And that's like in, this is like in the first minute of the day. Um, going forward, uh, that same technology can lay in electronics. You can do multiple materials. My printer, the one my children grow up with right now, does does a one color in sort of dot matrixy, you know, a very kind of a rough resolution. The next version does, did better resolution. The next version that's going to be they're going to be getting for Christmas. Don't tell them. Um, is camera is going to be is is is, is two colors um, in high resolution. The next one is going to be three colors, and now you're kind of being able to kind of create a multicolor thing. Um, in even higher resolution, the version after that, which doesn't exist yet, but is going to be able to do multiple materials. And I had um, uh, uh, lunch with Craig Venter, the biologist, uh, last week in New York. And, he's, and what he's working on is a printer for biology, for DNA, where in his vision, you know, you just, rather than going to the doctor and getting our flu shot for the season, which is a guess at what the pandemic flu is going to be this season, instead, you know, when they figure out which, which, whichever one it is that's hitting right now, they'll just, the doctor will just email you a little, little sort of a encrypted uh, email. You press the button and out comes the vaccine, um, custom made on demand. Um, obviously, at this point, one has to ask questions like, what could possibly go wrong, um, <laughs> et, et cetera. But, but, but you know, once you get 3D and multi-material and multi-color and multi-resolution, it's like the Star Trek replicator. So what is the difference, if any, between the hacker culture of the 80s and 90s and the aughts and the, the one which is focused on the bits yeah. and the culture that you see developing today, which is focused on the physical objects? Are they the same people? They're the, they're the same people. Um, they're the same people with a, a, a wider tool palette. Um, you know, what we, what we discovered was, you know, the Homebrew Computing Club, which Jobs and Wozniak were part of and created the Apple, was a uh, subculture of extremely technically advanced geeks. And, and, that, and that, created, you know, that, that, that created an amazing thing, but it, it, didn't, you know, it didn't create a, a movement um, until it got into the hands of, of consumers as a product. 
Um, along came the web, and the web, you didn't have to be as sophisticated and as technically advanced. And that created a movement of its, of its own. Now we're, now with the maker movement, which is basically the, the web meets, meets manufacturing, um, you, you basically simplify the process of manufacturing such that it's, it's, it's anybody and everybody. And it's everything from Etsy, which is sort of the crafty, kind of you know, artisanal side, to Kickstarter, which is more of the kind of um, startups for manufacturing. It's open source hardware, it's um, tech shops and maker spaces, it's uh, a zillion parents. Well, well, talk about some of the specific products. I mean, because the book is really the book, when you get a chance to read the book or print the book, you will discover it's really about how this is going to change the economy. So what are the, some of the businesses, what are some of the actual products that are, that are coming up or are about to come towards us? Besides, I mean, Etsy is a great example, but what else? Well, so Etsy and Kickstarter, let me do a quick show of hands. How many people here have backed a Kickstarter project? I don't think I need to say anything more about that. Um, you know, amazing phenomena, crowdfunding. Um, basically, all those Kickstarter projects you funded are basically maker movement industrialized. That's an example of what manufacturing can, tools can do when they get in the hands of regular people. Um, how many people bought something from Etsy? Uh, about the same number. So those, uh, that's a marketplace for um, artisanal, um, more, more crafty stuff. Some of it is maker. Um, I, by the way, I define maker as, and everyone defines maker differently, but it's, it, I think it was more of a cultural thing. It's the, it's the web generation meeting a new generation of technologies, these digital fabrication technologies. Um, a lot of, you don't have to use a 3D printer to be a maker. Um, I think you probably have to use the web in some sense or another to, 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 to you know, fall into my definition of maker. But those are two great examples. Um, you asked for an example of a product. Um, uh, let me just actually pull up a, 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 a slide. Um, this is a, I appear to have violated a protocol here by bringing an iPad into Microsoft. I apologize. <laughs> Let's see if this will work. Um, okay. Um, so um, this, this may or may not come up. Um, yeah. So this is uh, a uh, this is this is like you know my favorite Kickstarter project. You may be familiar with it. it's the Pebble Watch. Um, what, what I love about this particular example is that when this was released, and um, I, uh, I'm not sure exactly what date it was, it was, um, it was in, in early May of this, uh, this year. On the same week, Sony released their smartwatch, the Sony smartwatch. And when I was a kid, the Sony smartwatch would have sort of filled my fantasies for you know, a, a, a solid year as I imagined my Dick Tracy future brought to me by Sony. Um, Sony released their smartwatch, and four kids in Palo Alto uh, put this thing on Kickstarter. I, now, how many people here uh, have, have heard of the Pebble smartwatch? Oh, good. How many people here have heard of the Sony smartwatch? Yeah. So um, that's, kind of, that's kind of the answer right there, that, that the fact is, is that the combination of Kickstarter, which is the web model, it's crowdfunding, it's community, it is um, uh, market research, um, it's all kind of cool web innovation model stuff, plus the fact that four kids in Palo Alto are likely to be more innovative than any big company, not, not, not highlighting Sony in particular, um, and the fact that they're social, they're inherently social, the maker movement is inherently social, and that propagates news and information, does better marketing than any big company can do. That's why you've heard of the Pebble smartwatch and haven't heard of the Sony watch. And this is why that's going to be a better product, and they're going to, they're going to beat one of the biggest consumer electronic companies in the world. So, so what, what do you make of the fact that the Pebble smartwatch is now behind? It, they were supposed to come out in whenever it was, August, September. They're, they're, they're behind. Manufacturing's hard, yeah. and you know, um, they're a couple months behind. Um, you know, from end to end, they will have gotten out the door, and they're going to get out the door, they'll be fine. From end to end, they will have gotten out the door, and I, I would estimate a third the time of Sony. And they're doing it for the first time, and Sony's doing it for the umpteenth time. So yeah, they're, they're, they're a little slow, because they set a target of $100,000, and they got $10 million plus, and they suddenly realized they had to make 100,000 of these things, and that's just, that's hard. Um, but they'll get there. So what kind of products? do you think are going to come in the first, this sort of first generation of the maker economy? What sort of things are we going to see now, and what sort of things may we see in the, you know, 10 years from now, and what sort of things will we never see? What sort of things right. will never be made by, by four guys in Palo Alto? 
a uh, iPhone is not going to be made by four guys in Palo Alto, although, you know, it starts with two guys in Palo Alto. Um, but, but, you know, re, there's, there's a level of complexity that I think you're going to need mass manufacturing and incredible industrial skill to do. And I'm not suggesting the same with the long tail, which was about sort of the rise of, of, of the niche or life beyond the blockbuster. And in the same way, it wasn't the end of Hollywood, but the end of the Hollywood monopoly. You know, Hollywood exists, but so does YouTube. So does this sort of bottoms up, you know, grassroots entrepreneurial democratized manufacturing um, offer a kind of a long tail stuff. It's an opportunity for small, you know, innovative teams to pick off those markets of 10,000 that the mass manufacturing world doesn't want to get at, and that we've sort of lost the ability to do with the traditional method here in the U.S. So what? So let's. So what are some particulars? What kind of things do you well, think we will see? Uh, so I, I, you know, if you look at Kickstarter, it's, it's anything and everything. It is, you know, it is. Yes, it's electronics like this. It is, um, you know, vehicles. It is jewelry. It is um, kitchen appliances. It is. Uh, toys. It is. I mean, go into Walmart, and it's, it's. You know, you pretty much. There's a company called Corky, um, which does a bit of this kind of stuff, and they kind of focus on the Bed Bath and Beyond market. So, like everything in Bed Bath and Beyond, there's kind of like a Corky, you know, a maker movement version of it. It's. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to. I mean, it's like asking. So, what do we make in the United States? And the answer is kind of everything. Um, but it starts with the things that really lend themselves to the web innovation model, which is to say stuff that can be described with a digital file. Um, so like a CAD file, something like that, and it can be traded and exchanged and, uh, and you, know, you can build communities around. It's stuff that can be prototyped on some of the tools we're talking about, 3D printers, CNC machines, laser cutters. It's um, stuff that um, doesn't require you know, you know, r like semiconductor skills to, to make. In other words, it uses commodity electronics. Um, and you can sort of put together the bits and pieces. That's how the Apple II was started. They, didn't, you know, they just bought commodity electronics from Fry's or whatever the equivalent was at the time. And, and put it together, and you know, and that's and you know, the, what we do mostly, and what these guys are doing as well, is just take advantage of what's going on with the smartphone revolution. That there's this like extraordinary technology advances. Got another non-Microsoft product. <laughs> 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 um, Got to stop doing this. Um, uh, um, it's extraordinary technology advances going on in the race between Apple, Microsoft, and, and 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 Google, and as a result, all these little chips in here are now available at Radio Shack. Um, which means that you know all the non-smartphone applications for s sensors and processors and GPS and cameras and all this kind of stuff is just waiting for the micro crowd to, to figure it out. Um, but so I mean, you, you want to you, you know you, you want examples, and I think basically um, you know the answer is is that you know in in the garages and workshops of America, people have always been tinkering and laboring and inventing stuff, but they weren't doing it in public, they weren't doing it together, and they couldn't scale up into actual manufacturing, and now they can. Right. The, talk about the together, because one of the really great insights of this book is the way in which these products come out of communities. Not necessarily, they don't necessarily come out of traditional businesses. They come out of communal activity. So what, what describe a little bit of that? Yeah. So I think if there's one thing that defines the web model, it's this notion of, of, of doing things in public. We talk in public, Facebook. We, we work in public. We, we, we instinctively share. We put, when we do something, we post it on YouTube. It's, it's, it's not altruism, it's not showing off, it's some combination of the two, but we just kind of, we work in public and you're, you're instinctively there, I'm instinctively there, we wouldn't be here. Um, what happens when you work in public is that you intentionally or not end up with a new innovation model. Um, you put up your, your bad idea and someone sort of comments on it, makes it better, and you kind of ratchet up. So, the, you know, in the, in, the, in the 20th century inventor model, everyone worked by themselves in their garages and then it, it didn't show it until it was done, and it was almost never done. <laughs> in the web model, you kind of have a half-baked idea, you toss it out there, you, you shoot a, a, you know, a shaky video and put it on YouTube, and people see it, and they're like, oh, well, that's been done, but here's something that I could add to that or go above it. And we, and we by simply just you know, recognizing what the baselines are out there, we, end up, we, we stop reinventing the wheel and start kind of working together to, to build a vehicle. And, that's, and, that's, and that, I think, is what we're seeing with them. So, for example, in electronics, which is, what I, which is how I got started in this. Um, we uh, have a couple of simple things. We have something called Arduino, which is a, um, a, a, a very simple computing board that you can buy and anybody can use. You don't have to be an expert. Um, uh, we uh, have uh, something that gets really wonky, but there's a um, my microphone's slightly pulling out here. Um, uh, there is a, um, a free software called um, Eagle. Um, Cat's, uh, Eagle PCB uh, design software, which allowed us to share the design files really easily. It was free. That was important. 
Um, uh, the big the big part suppliers got good websites, and so you can just buy like you know four four or something rather than four million of something from like you know a, a big you know a, a major supply house. And um, there are all these services that will like make printed circuit boards for you. You can just upload a file, and they just make it for you. And it was just little things like that. But suddenly, you know, a guy like me who knows nothing about electronics can create an, an autopilot. Um, you know, in in matter we build a community around it and shared our ignorance, and people sort of taught us stuff, and they kind of pointed us to links, and three years later, we're competing with Lockheed Martin. So one of the premises of makers is that there's a huge amount of, of you, you call it, I mean, cognitive surplus, or I think you call it dark energy, yeah. just that people are uh, inherently dissatisfied or, or are not using their full selves in their day-to-day -day lives, and they're ready to deploy it in another way. I mean, I, I, think, this, I think there's two things going on. One is that... I, I think we're all makers in some sense or another. I mean, if you're if you're if you like to cook, you know, we all understand the the, the sort of the, the the simple pleasures and satisfaction of working with your hands. If you like to cook, you you get it. You're making your own feel your, your your own meal. If you like to garden, you get it. If you tinker in your workshop, you know, kids playing with blocks, that that's making. Um, what 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 happens is is we, we get it sort of knocked out of us um, at the sense that this could be anything we could do in public um, pretty quickly. Um, first of all, it gets hard to use like sophisticated tools. Um, you know, second, um, even if you could invent something cool, it's not cl it wasn't clear initially how you would turn it into a business or, or, or get it out there. Third, it wasn't really a language for sharing designs. We didn't have things like 3D, you know, CAD files, etc. Um, and, you know, and, and, and fourth of all, you know, it, was, it wasn't your job. You know, it was, it, was, it, was your, it was your hobby, and we're a little sort of embarrassed about our, our hobbies. I mean, one of the great things about the web is that it sort of destigmatized amateurism. Right. And, you know, the way, we don't think about it much, but the web is the first platform in history where the professionals and amateurs are on the same playing field, head to head. Um, you and I compete with amateurs. I mean, we, we compete with each other, but we compete with amateurs even more so. And um, they have equal access to the reader. Um, we're, we're all competing for this, the uh, same eyeballs. And amateurism is not, is not, you know, the fact that someone has a great blog, no one asks you what your business model is. And that, I think, was a liberating factor, which allowed those tinkerers of the world to both have a, you know, uh, a, see what other people are doing, be inspired by what, by what other people are doing, have a language to describe what they're doing, whether it be a CAD file or a YouTube video, and then a platform where it wasn't embarrassing to show your stuff. And, and what do big companies, what do the Microsofts or the, the Lockheed Martins or the General Electrics of the world do about this? Are they inherently uh, not going to be able to participate in maker movement, or is there some way they can, you know, steal it, uh, pay, overpay these people salaries and, and keep the energy of the maker movement, or is it impossible? That's a great question, and, and I think everyone's wrestling with this. I mean, it's like, what does Hollywood do with YouTube? You know, I suppose, that, you know, I mean, it's like, what did Gandhi say? You know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you've won. Um, you know, I, I suppose that, um, you know, Hollywood would initially, you know, the big companies initially laughed at this. Um, then they, um, uh, then they uh, you know, tried to co-opt it. And you know, and you know, try to you know open the up these that are you know crowdsourcing initiatives and open innovation, et cetera. Not so much co-opting in a negative sense, but they tried to kind of you know coattail on it. Um, then they realized that um, some of these things were becoming competition. The smartwatch being being a perfect example. And I think over time, the best of them are going to figure out some way to actually use it, and it's going to be scary. Uh, GE is a great example. GE is you know um, trying to figure out. I mean, GE started in you know a tinkerer working in his workshop, Thomas Edison. Um, you know, the heart and soul of American industry, um, very much driven by, by innovation, and asking themselves, wh how, what do we do about the maker movement? And they're starting with things like sponsoring maker spaces. Um, uh, they get around all the maker fairs, teaching people about the tools. They've done some open innovation competitions where people's ideas get turned into products by GE or invested in by GE. Um, and, um, and now they're asking questions like, you know, um, does GE have technologies that they could share? Um, and, you know, algorithms that could make products better, manufacturing easier. I mean, Thomas everybody. Edison's an interesting, interesting example because Thomas Edison, of course, spent much of his life using patent law, using the law to destroy competitors and, right. and defeat competitors. And, and that, that's obviously something which has become a terrible uh, uh, weight on the American economy generally and on this particular part of the American economy. So, so is, are the makers, when, when, what's going to happen when the makers run up against people's patents? We're going to get sued. We, we know that. 
We know that. Um, uh, I'm going to get sued. I mean, it's, I'm absolutely, no, I can, I can tell you with certainty I'm going to be sued. I'm going to be sued sooner or later, um, hopefully later. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, we are, we are, you know, hobbyists turned entrepreneurs turned, you know, megalomaniacs, you know, I mean, this is what the web does is it's you sort of, you're incentivized to try things out, to iterate, to throw it out there, see what happens. Um, uh, you know, I'm part of the open hardware movement. And you're, you're right. I, I don't protect intellectual property in my in my in my night jobs. In my day job, I'm required to protect copyright. Um, we um, uh, we we have a lot of forums where we talk about um, law and IP. And the simple answer is no one knows what the rules are. Um, take take patent law for example. Um, there's two ways to approach this. Uh, you can either do a patent search and find out whether you're going to violate. Um, um, a patent, you probably won't get a good answer. And then um, if you then do violate a patent, the fact that you did a search right. first actually increases your liability. Or you can do what we do, which is just do it, wait for the letter. Um, when the letter comes, try to you know, innovate around it. Um, if the trolls come after us, one of us is going to have to be brave enough to fight, fight back. And the courts will ultimately decide. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, there's, a, there's an iceberg ahead, and we know that, um, which is that which is, as the amateurs start to compete with the professionals, the professionals get scared. And, you know, as, as each of us crosses the $10 million revenue, um, you know, level, um, they're going to start coming after us. Have there been any suits yet? In the 3D printer space, yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, um, uh, some of the 3D printer companies in the open source realm have started patenting, which, which just makes their skin crawl. I mean, we're so opposed to patents. And they've been patenting simply defensively. So when the letter comes, they'll have something else to throw back. Huh. It's a sad thing. So, so let's, um, let's go back to the, the cognitive surplus and the human capital and the, the uh, many of, much of your book begins with, I was tinkering in my basement, or I don't know if it was in your basement, your garage, someplace with your, your children and blah, 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 and then you spin off of that. Usually your children appear to give up after about 12 hours. Um, but, on, on a but, good day. <laughs> but uh, how, what is it at the level of policy, because this is Washington, it's a policy town, what is it at the level of policy that government should be doing to, to in, you know, build these skills and encourage the, the maker instinct. Absolutely. Well, you know that because I come from Silicon Valley, I'm sort of contractually required to say, get out of the way. Putting that aside, I actually think there's a lot the government can do. Can I just show one thing I do with my, uh, um, uh, so I, I, I uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I've got a wireless mic, good. <laughs> it doesn't always happen that way. Um, I am, uh, I, I use my children all the time as props, and I'm just, um, Saying that in, in advance um, because, well, exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, so I that was I, in the basement too, strangely. <laughs> oh my! Okay, I can see that the tools you've got. I'm going to have to clear my mind of that. For, um, uh, um, so I, I've got five kids, and I really want them to get interested in science and technology, and just fail and fail and fail again. We actually started a whole site, which is now a line of books called Geek Dad. Um, and, and it's all about finding projects that will inspire the kids into science and technology. And I just, just not having any success ex until we got a, a MakerBot, which is a 3D printer. And so I've got the three girls, and they are, um, they uh, were kind of strict about video game time. They're only allowed two hours of video game time each weekend day, so four hours in total. When, and the girls, during their time, play The Sims. Uh, this is The Sims 3. Does anyone know The Sims 3? It's kind of a, it's a, it's a good, great video game. It's kind of a dollhouse game. You build a house, you, buy, you put in cool furniture, you populate it with people. Um, very clever, by the way. The, the, uh, it was originally an architecture sim, and then the people were just inserted because uh, the designer, Will Wright, needed a way to score the architecture, and it turns out the best way to score architecture is with the happiness of the people in the, in the building. So he invented the people to, to be the happiness metric of the, 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 the building. Anyway, so the, the, the girls built really cool um, houses in the sims, and then the time's up, and we're like, it's time to turn off the computer and play in the real world. And by the way, you have a real doll. And they're like, oh, but it's got the wrong furniture. It's not nearly as cool. And I was like, you know, will you go, Dad, will you go to Amazon and buy me some new furniture? And, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm a little sucker, but, but, uh, but I, 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 do, I do know that I, this ultimately going to get to no, but I have to, I have to explain why it's going to be no. So we, we search on Amazon for, for dollhouse furniture. I'm going to go on a little dollhouse furniture rant here. This is probably not what you expected. But <laughs> <laughs> number one, it's crazy expensive. 
Um, number two, there's almost no choice. And number three, that you can never get the right size. Um, there's no standardization of dollhouse furniture. And even if you got the right size for the house, it's not the right size for the people because they don't bend properly and don't sit in the couches. <laughs> anyway, the answer ultimately was no, you can't have dollhouse furniture. Um, however, we do have a maker bot. So I said, let's go to Thingiverse, which is this repository of online um, CAD designs, and let's see if we can find any dollhouse furniture there. And we found uh, a whole series that was just right. They were kind of doing this, um, I don't know what you would call this, maybe, uh, uh, maybe kind of a French Renaissance um, uh, design. That's, that's, not, that's not French Renaissance? No. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is. Um, and um, it turns out that there's this a woman who goes by the screen name of Pretty Small Things who is by day, she's a set designer on Broadway. She does theatrical sets. And by night, she designs beautiful dollhouse furniture and gives it away for free. Um, on, on a Thingiverse. And because we have a 3D printer, we just print it out, and then the girls paint it, and then it goes in the, um, in the dollhouse. And they actually love it so much that they put it on the shelves of their bedroom. And if you're a toy company, this should just fill you with terror. Because this is not as high quality as the stuff you get is made in China. But m my girls designed this. I mean, they didn't really design it. They just actually just dragged a slider that made it the right scale. But they felt there was a little bit of themselves in it. They made a contribution to it. They then painted it. Uh, by the way, the boys, um, the boys do a Warhammer 40K <laughs> mechs, as you would expect. Um, but they, they made it themselves. They, add, they, they put a little maker spirit, a little, a little you know, painting, a little customization. Um, it's exactly what they wanted. And it was easy. And this is, this is, you know, this is not going to replace all the toys in their lives, but it's going to replace a lot of them. And so, I, and so what are they doing here, to answer your question? They're doing digital design. They're um, starting with CAD files, which is what that original one was. They're then modifying those CAD files in a CAD program. They're then outputting it on a rapid prototyping machine. Um, and then they're painting it with a, with a paintbrush. But, but the, the, these are skills that you used to have to go to like, like college and, you know, and get an industrial design degree to do. And they just realized that basically, you know, what have you learned on the web? You learn on the web that all information, everything you, in the world is on the web. You can get it for free, and you can modify it if you want. And that's kind of what they're learning now for physical goods as well. That anything they can imagine, they can just sort of find something, that, you know, kind of a starting point, modify it, output it, and it's theirs. And that is a... You know, that, that, that lesson, that design is something that everybody can do, cap taking the capital D out of design in the same way we took the capital J out of journalism and the capital P out of publishing, and that's an incredibly empowering lesson for kids to learn. And I think that if one, there's one thing government can do, it's to integrate, is to put design into the national curriculum, digital design in particular. I think it's as simple, as matter, as simple matter as take the computer labs we already have, and right next to those two laser printers at the end of the row, put two 3D printers. And the rest is, the rest is, is, is it's done. You know, you have to obviously figure out who's going to teach, what's the curriculum going to be, you know, um, who's going to replace the, you know, the plastic when it's when it's run out. But it, those are small problems. We've already got the labs. Huh. So really, you just think it's a matter of just this, this equipment plus, plus the innate curiosity of children, and uh, will will do enough. You have you have kids, yeah. Yes. Yes. Do you have a three D printer yet? I don't have a three D printer. How old are your kids? 11, 9, and 4. Do you have plans for presents this holiday season? <laughs> it's, a, it's a really interesting idea. No, it's, it's, a very, it's, it's very tempting. It is very tempting. I mean, I, I run into the extruded plastic doodad problem. We already have enough extruded plastic doodads. Do you the have idea that I would manu manufacture them in my home seems slightly alarming. <laughs> Well, I, I can't fight the whole plastic problem, but, you know, um, things your kids made and value and right. treasure, as opposed to things that they got from McDonald's, I, I think I know which one's going to stick around right. longer there. No, no, I mean, I, I'm, I've been making with my, my middle son, we made, you know, evil mad science, yeah. making, you know, a little digital alarm clock Sodom and all that iron. stuff and soldering the yeah. hell out of stuff. Um, but I'm wondering, it just happens that you and I are amazing dads. Right, but what about those people who are not so fortunate? Well, I mean, I, do, I, mean, I think this is like the, you, you, you are writing from perspective of someone who really has done this with your children. It, this is your thing, and it, and then you have a society where kids are just like, you know, they're taking really boring math tests all the time, and and you know, you, you how do you? I, I want this stuff to be transferred broadly. Sure, I mean, when I think my this is on. I guess it is. Um, when you and I were in high school, I'm sort of guessing at we're 
more or less the same age. Um, we had shop class, industrial arts, and you know there was home economic, and there were like sewing machines and ovens and band saws, and we made as I recall bongs and ninja throwing stars. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was the tail end of an era of, of the last great making era of America, where we were manufacturing. By the way, we are still America is still the number one manufacturing economy in the world. It's just not creating manufacturing jobs the way it once was. But at, you know, in, in the mid 20th century, a factory job was the route to the middle class. This was, you know, we were learning industrial skills because you could get a job, a good job from that. And then by the time we were in college, that was no longer true. The jobs were already, uh, already moving. Um, and then, you know, budget cuts and um, you know, lack, of, lack of professional relevance and liability issues and those shop classes all got taken out and computer classes came in and we learned PowerPoint. Not there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and typing skills and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I think this is an opportunity to reinstate shop class, but not with big, expensive, you know, rooms full of bandsaws and, you know, and liability concerns, but simply the addition design into the computer curriculum that we, that we already have. And, and you know, I, I, I see no reason why this couldn't be in the public school curriculum. I don't think it's, a, it's, it's, it's exclusive to privilege. I mean, these, these, these 3D printers don't cost any more than the laser printer. Right. Right. It's really weird, though, and I, I mean, I hope there's some great Washington policy people here tonight, because... It does seem to me this is an incredibly simple, obvious, really useful sort of policy fix for the government to be involved in. You know, it's a chance for government to do something where it appears they can do something pretty easily and quickly and have a genuinely good effect. But I don't hear, I mean, Tom Khalil, I did an event with Tom Khalil, and so that this Obama White House at least is thinking about this. But well, I, I, are we going yes, to get somewhere? I have, I have a little bit of good news. Um, it shouldn't be news, I think. Probably people in this room may know this, but uh, DARPA in particular has. Um, uh, uh, as a project with um, O'Reilly, which created, the, 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 coined the term make and maker movement and has uh, Make Magazine and all that. And I think they're, they're putting digital design classes in something on the order of 1,200 schools um, over the next three years. So there is an effort to do this. Um, let me show you one, uh, another slide. I just wanted to kind of make, um, I just want to make, you know, show you just how easy this is. Um, uh, so um, let me just, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so you know how Apple, when they came out with the iPad, iPod rather, had the, the, their marketing slogan was rip, mix, burn? Um, which was you know, kind of mind-blowing at the time. You could rip music from a CD into your computer. You could then change it and create new playlists and all this kind of stuff, modify it, and then you could burn it onto a CD, which is a form of manufacturing in, in those days. And you know, it was awesome. It was cool. It you know, destroyed the music industry. And, you know, and, but yeah, but rich, enriched society and empowered us all. So the maker equivalent of it is rip, mod, make. What does that mean? What does it mean to rip reality? And the simple answer is that uh, your, your phone right now can, it can be a 3D scanner. Um, just using the camera, you just w walk around an object. You can, I could have done it right there with that, with that uh, iPad. You walk around an object, click, 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 send the objects, uh, images into the cloud. It then assembles them and creates a, creates a, um, a 3D um, mesh. Um, which uh, looks like that, which you then, um, which you can then uh, clean up and modify again using free apps on your on your tablet to fix it, and then you print it out as a Pez dispenser, as one does. <laughs> um, so, so this is free. These are free apps. I mean, this is kind of you know, someday my you know our a generation will laugh at us for being impressed. But this you know, 3D scanning, reality capture, you know, modifying sophisticated 3D meshes of polygons with your fingers on a tablet. Outputting them on your desktop. This is, I mean, this is like this was like you know really industrial stuff like just a few years ago, and now it's all free stuff on you know on your on your, on your tablet. And and the um, oops, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, the uh, I just want to show you what the what the um, the uh, the um, the software. And this is another one by Auto from Autodesk. Um, it's so easy. Um, you know how on your print on on, on your in, in Microsoft Word you go to the file menu and there's this there's this menu item that says print. I I, I know this. You you've seen it. Um, it's, 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 this does not seem so impressive, but it's kind of amazing that print. You know the you know getting machines to work for you is simply an item. Well now these these CAD programs have these items called make, and you go to the file menu and you pick make, and it just walks you through this this sort of wizard that. It helps you figure out whether you want to output in 2D or 3D, whether you want to do it on your desktop machine or whether you want to upload it to a service. 
to create what material, what the kind of cost implications are, some material properties, strength issues. I mean, these are like, you know, armies of PhDs and, and generations of industrial experience turned into a little software wizard that's free on your desktop. So when I, when, you know, the notion of putting industrial design into a high school curriculum would have been crazy 10 years ago. And now this is just like, it's just a, just a menu item in free software. And kids completely get this stuff. If you can play Minecraft, you can do three, you know, CAD, CAD software. So one last question, then we'll go to your questions, which is, uh, can we fit that the chart up there? Is that doable? Or is it is Chris's? So, there, mm. so you have a great graph about where it makes sense to make things, where, far, where, where it makes yeah. sense to make stuff in China, and where it makes sense to make stuff here. And I found it just very intellectually satisfying to look at it. And I wondered if you would just explain that. Abs absolutely. This is based on my own experience. Um, while that's coming up, I should just say that um, my little sort of parenting gone wrong thing. So I was playing with my kids. We were playing with Lego, Mindstorms, we, you know, planes. I, I, I kind of realized that this whole smartphone technology was useful. And I just really, I mean, it started literally with putting Lego in a plane, um, which kind of almost worked to fly the plane. And then the kids lost interest, and I went down the rabbit hole. And, uh, and five years later, we have a multi-million dollar robotics company that put more, puts more drones in the air every year than the whole US military fleet. Our drones are, are small and cheap. And and how many people have you and killed? Safe. And, and, <laughs> and safe. And um, our drones are for, are for uh, and imaging and video and fun. And um, what, they, what our drones do, if you're, a, if you're a windsurfer, this is a very California example, I realize. But if you're a windsurfer, um, it's the GoPro generation. You totally want cool video of your extreme sports. Um, but the problem is it's really hard to video your windsurfing because people are too far away. What you really need is a robot helicopter to come behind you, position itself 30 feet behind, 30 feet above, and just follow you around, <laughs> which we now do. Um, so that's, oh, that's a $600. That's what, it, that's, you know, that's what a drone's for in, outside of the military context. And that's what, ours, that's what ours do, among others. Oh, it didn't come up. Not possible. All right. Not possible. It's OK. Um, I could draw it if we had a. I, we don't have a whiteboard. No. Um, well, I, I mean, it, it, ba well, just give, yeah. explain the basic idea of it. The, so the basic. So I, I call this a new industrial revolution. I think this is the future of American manufacturing, and I need to defend this. Uh, so today, um, uh, I, my, my drone company runs two factories: one in San Diego, one in one in Tijuana. And uh, the Tijuana connection is kind of interesting um, it, it, because. Because this starts on the web and uses the web innovation model, one of the great things about the web is that no one asks you for your, like, for your title um, you know, before they start talking to you. It's basically, what can you do? Show the, show the YouTube video, show your demo, and, and we don't, don't really care what credentials you have. And so as we started this community to kind of figure out how cell phone technology could be used to be the future of aerospace, um, people started bringing in ideas. And there was this one guy who was like flying this helicopter with a Wii controller, and he's using Arduino. It's really cool. So when it came, when we, once we started coming up with good designs, we, um, people started saying, can you just make it for us? And um, I realized we were going to have to start a company. And this guy who was flying the, control, the helicopter with a Wii seemed like the best guy. And so I said, let's start a company. He said, OK. His name was Jordi Munoz. And um, when it came, it came time to sign the like, you know, incorporation documents, I said, yeah, I should probably find out a something about you, Jordi. Can you tell me something about yourself? He was, um, uh, it turns out when I met him, he was a 19-year-old living in Tijuana, just graduated from high school. Uh, he'd moved to he'd moved to uh, Los Angeles and um, uh, still hadn't gone to college. And uh, today he's the CEO of a multi-million dollar aerial robotics company. And um, I thought that he was the, the smartest guy in the world at like robotics and stuff. And it turns out he he was super smart and super curious, but he had access to the internet and 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 learned everything that way. But but what I really what he really ended up teaching me was about manufacturing. Um, and I thought the fact that he was a teenager living in Tijuana was a liability. I mean, what are the odds that when the editor of Wired decides to start a drone company, he ends up co-founding it with a teenager in Tijuana? But here's what a teenager in Tijuana knows that you that, that we go in some bad directions. That, that we, that, that we, well, exactly. When you when you hear Tijuana, you probably think cheap cheap tequila, drug cartels. It probably gets goes downhill from there. Tijuana is the Shenzhen of North America. Every screen you own, every flat screen you own was made in Tijuana. They, they have massive Samsung, Sony, you know, Sharp, et cetera, these massive electronics factories. Tijuana's population is three times that of San Diego. It is, 
you know, this is I, this is NAFTA. It's the Maquiadoras. It's the it, this is this is how we bring manufacturing back to North America is by using the fact the fact that we do have an industrial base, a really good industrial base with awesome. Mexico graduates more engineers than the United States. I mean, Mexico, all those ISO 9000 compliant, all those really manufacturing expert, great manufacturing experts who who left, you know, you know, the heartland of America, they didn't leave, you know. Tijuana. That's where they still are, and that's what my that's what Jordy knew. <laughs> Excuse me. He knew that that the way we were going to bring manufacturing back from China was to use this sort of San Diego for the engineering, uh, Tijuana for the for the for the manufacturing nexus. By the way, it's 20 minutes between the two. You don't show a passport on the way. You just you drive. It's like it's like driving between France and Germany. You you totally show a passport passport on the way back though. But um, but but there's you know but it, it's 20 minutes down, like 40 minutes back. Um, it's no big deal. So what we learned is that um, that where you make something um, is now a, an open question, um, and it starts like this: you start with making one of something in your prototype. That's that's your basement. Get it? Then you make ten of something, um, and you've got a little sort of you just repeated it, and that's you know that's, that, those are those are beta beta tests. Now you now people are like that's pretty good. I'd like one. At this point, you're talking about 300 of something, 400. You do not want to be sitting around your kitchen table soldering those. So you go to a service. Um, and that might be might be in China who will put the boards together, et cetera. Okay, that's pretty good. You go from like you know 300, 500, maybe a thousand of those, and now you realize now you've learned something. Like those Kickstarter guys are learning. You've learned something about manufacturing. Number one, you've learned that when you send when you send things out to to China, first of all, for economies of scale, they really encourage you to buy five thousand or ten thousand. You need you need need to buy big numbers. And you're like, okay, well that just means you wrote a big check. Like all your capital is now caught up in in inventory. Okay, maybe you can handle that. Maybe you've got lots of money. Um, so now, now you now it's you know you're making five thousand or something. It comes back. It's like, oh my God, what if it's wrong? What if what if it's, I made a mistake? That could be a huge expense. Okay, let's say you got it right. Fine, you've got you you made five thousand of these things. You now start selling. You put it out in the distribution channel, and they start selling. And you realize that you can no longer innovate. You can't change your design. You're stuck. You've got to sell them all before you're allowed to make a new version, and it's a it's a huge drag on innovation. So batch processing and long supply chains are basically a terrible thing from from a cash perspective and a terrible thing from an innovation perspective. So at that point, you're like, okay, I'm not going to do that. What's the alternative? Shorter supply chains, make it at home. And you're like, how would I make electronics? And then you Google around a little bit, and they're like, turns out you need something called a pick and place machine. It's like a robot machine that puts chips on boards. You're like pick and place machine. How could I get one? You go on eBay. They're like three thousand dollars used on eBay, which is how. And that's what Jordy found out. He went on eBay. He got a pick and place machine. He went on. He went on Google and found the manual to the pick and place machine. We 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 got we turned a to he went to he went to Walmart, got a toaster oven, put an Arduino on it. And now he had a reflow oven, which is another <laughs> essential part of it. And then he kept iterating. He got a better pick and place machine. He got a better toaster oven. And today we have you know multiple hundred thousand dollar pick and place machines, massive reflow ovens. We have kind of world class manufacturing, but it happens step by step. And we did it because making something locally is is maybe ten percent less efficient from a from a labor perspective, about a hundred percent more efficient from a flexibility perspective. We do just in time manufacturing. We do small batches, and as a result, we we do sixty four boards at a time. And as a result, we're highly incentivized to continue innovating. Our cash is all sort of conserved. And um, and we don't have these you know political, environmental um, quality risks of the long supply chain in, um, in China. And then, but then the, the final stage, if you were got big enough, it does make sense to go back there, right? Right. So that's that's in the sort of we sell we sell tens of thousands of things. Now, once we get to hundreds of thousands and millions of things, at this point, those ten percent labor costs start to start to add up, and then you know, and 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 the design becomes more stable, and we're not sort of iterating as quickly, and then you're like, okay. Fine. We know what we're doing. We have high confidence in what we in what we want. Um, we have competitors, so the prices need to be low. And then you go back to Foxconn, and you say, and "Now I'm ready for for China again." But uh, but I've de-risked it. Um, you know, the the business is sustainable, and I'm going to China for the right reason, which is doing what they do especially well, rather than because it's the only way to manufacture. All right. Uh, I've talked enough. Let's go to your questions, with which I'm sure you have many. We'll start right here, and we'll sort of move around. And I think just is there a mic? Is it Michael? Okay. Why don't you say who you are? Hi, my name is Christine Prefontaine. Is this working? Yeah. Um, it's more of a, a comment than a question, which is I think uh, you're missing one big place, which is the public library. And, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Especially for people who 
school didn't work out for them or don't have lots of ideas. And you know, we're over with the public library being yeah. the model of the repository, the technology of the book. It's already a place people go to access tech. Absolutely. And they're starting to be maker spaces there. So Absolutely. how do we get that to scale up and go global? Great, great question. So you're absolutely right. Um, and a makerspace, um, uh, by the way, just to show you a picture that I may or may not be able to get us back up. A makerspace is just kind of a, um, like a gym um, for, for manufacturing. Um, thank you. Um, this, this is what a makerspace looks like. Um, and uh, this will come up in a second. Um, this, is, this is a... Um, this is a, a tech shop, which is kind of a professional makerspace, and it uses the, the gym model where, you know, like with a gym for like $100 a month, you have access to machinery you wouldn't otherwise afford and couldn't otherwise afford or wouldn't want in your house, and trainers and other people who inspire you. This is the same thing for manufacturing. Um, you have access to 3D printers and laser cutters and all that. Um, this is a pretty big one, but you have much smaller ones. Um, and this is just a, a map right here of, um, of the makerspaces. Uh, as you can see, there's, there's, there's hundreds of them, possibly more than hundreds. Um, there's a few, I, I know two that are in libraries. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. Libraries are looking for their mission. And their mission you know, used to be just books, then became books and internet access. Then it was books, internet access, and community centers. And maybe it's books, internet access, community centers, and, and, maker, and you know, maker spaces. Um, the only problem is that um, the machines to date have been a little complicated and hard to maintain, and you need some you know, special skills, basically. Now, some libraries have people with those skills, but not, not all do. So I think it's, I think we're, remember, remember at, the long answer to this, remember that, you know, when we were going to college, that libraries were the place you got photocopies done. They were your kinkos, right? And so the big thing they had was they had a photocopier. The only place, before there was kinkos everywhere, there's the only place you could get a photocopier. I think, you know, Whatever that time was, I don't know how mature photocopier technology was when it was okay to put in a library and there was like a coin, you could put quarters in, et cetera, but that's kind of where we need to be on, on, on makerspace stuff. I think we're probably about three to five years away from the technology being so easy and simple and like, you know, photocopier-like that you could put it in any library. Um, right now you can put it in certain libraries where you have people who are really kind of focused on it, but I'd like to see it, I agree, I'd like to see it in every library. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm slightly worried about liability. Soldering irons and sewing machines both sound like they're going to be ouchy if you get, if you do it wrong. <laughs> but yeah, I hear you. Yeah. So right here. And then we'll go to you back there. We'll be next. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm French, but I moved to the United States to learn. So thank you. I learned a lot today. Uh, my responsibility, I'm also a member for UNESCO Task Force. My responsibility is to collect trends to uh, organize a curriculum for education yeah. in Europe. I just came back from China, in Shenzhen. How to identify the skills and to organize the education for the job which exists tomorrow. So it was the first World Congress in Dalian, China. Have you thought how we could get your ideas Organize them maybe in advance, inform in advance. Uh, not necessarily always the government, local communities. Mm. I learned a lot, much more from a rural area in Norway than from Oslo. We had three months demonstration in Museum of Modern Art in Oslo, the latest technologies. A rural area reacted more quickly, set up more quickly a uh, company to develop their own culture sure. and this content. So uh, the point I want to make to disseminate it as broadly yeah. as possible. G great question. Super glad you're asking that. Super glad you're doing it. Um, let me give you one answer, which is that um, one of the countries that actually might be the, the first to really do this is England. Um, we, we lost our shop classes in industrial arts in the 70s and 80s. But in, in the United Kingdom, you still have design technology. It's called DT. Um, those shop classes are still in most schools. And James Dyson, of the you know, vacuum cleaner Dyson, has a Dyson Foundation. And he's working with these DT classes to add digital to, to, the, to the curriculum, you know, laser cutters and 3D printers. Mm -hmm. I just visited one. Um, it's, it's, it's just starting to, to take off. And so I would suggest you contact the Dyson Foundation and ask for uh, their help in doing it globally. We'll go right here and then next over there. Hi. Um, <clears throat> oh. Oh. So um, 
wonderful uh, talk. I was curious about if you could highlight some of the more unsavory aspects of this sort of maker's culture. I mean, you know, f from the virtue of my, you know, my research and my, you know, analyst position, you know, I was looking at this and saying, wow, this is a wonderful way to disseminate knowledge. But at the same time, you know, if somebody had, you know, wrong intentions or less than positive intentions, they could certainly use 3D printing and, you know, some of this to do, you know, basic surveillance, to do surveillance on the cheap and to do production of weapons on the yeah. cheap. So I was wondering, you know, if you could sort of highlight or discuss if, you know, if this is something that sure. people are dealing with or, you know, or is this something that's more on the back burner? No, it's, it's a great question. We, we, we think about it all the time. Um, the simple answer is, is that, you know, towards evidence, all technologies can be used for good as well as evil. You know, the computer, you know, can be, can be used for, for evil. Hammer, can, you can hit someone over the head. And so, so um, our general perspective on this is, so, we, so my community does open source drones. I mean, you know, you, 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 part of me says fantastic, democratizing, you know, robotics. Part of me says open source drones. What are you kidding? I mean, I mean like anybody? And the answer is yes, anybody. Um, so um, how can I do that responsibly? Um, and, and the simple answer is, is that um, I don't feel it's my place to limit technology. I think it's my place to inform the regulators and those who are charged with protecting us on, on what's happening and let them do their job. So what we did is um, rather than limit who could use the technology, we, we reached out. We came to Washington many times, reached out to the FBI, the Pentagon, OSTP, um, every agency we could think of. We briefed them all on what, what, what was going on, constantly briefed them. Um, invited them into our community, told our community we're inviting them, uh, inviting you know, the FBI and others in, made a deal with the FBI that not only would we, in, you know, it, it would we encourage them to participate, but if we saw anything we saw unsavory, we would report it to the FBI, told our community we were going to do that. Um, and basically, we think our job is to, is to um, help, the, uh, help the regulators and law enforcement do their job better by surfacing this stuff that would have been happening in the underground anyway, but by doing it in public on the web, in a sense we're making it more visible, not less. And, and again, I, I'm slightly self-justifying, but we think we make it easier for, for the law enforcement to, to, to do their job rather than harder. And you know, let's face it, this stuff was out there already. It just wasn't, it wasn't being promoted by people who were focused on doing things under the bright, shining light of, a, of, 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 of an, uh, an open network the way we are. Right here, check your shirt. Hi. Hi, my name is uh, Jason uh, Arpino. Um, my question for you is actually with regard to this whole maker movement and why it's taken so long to, uh, for this movement to start. Um, when I was, I started high school when I was in, 1990s, in 1997. Uh, my high school was part of a program called Project Lead the Way. I was using AutoCAD mechanical desktop then. We had CNC mills. We had CNC drills. Wow. Um, and I, that's the first time that we, I used an injection molder, things like that. Um, that was part of a process that started in the 90s to transform, you know, as you were saying, these shop classes into, um, you know, like, you know, design technology kind of classes. Um, and yet still, 15 years later, we're seeing more and more of these shop classes kind of, you know, go by the wayside, yeah. yet these things, you know, are, are now even cheaper. Why hasn't those, why haven't those things, why haven't those programs picked up? Why has it taken so long? Why, why have my experiences in high school back in the 90s outpaced those from most kids that are going to, sure. to school today? Um, I, I'll give you an analogy. When Bill Gates was going to high school in, what, the 70s? He went to a very privileged high school in, in Seattle where they had access to a time-sharing system. They had access to a, to a computer. And, and um, this created Microsoft and, and, and all that. You know, I didn't. Um, when I went to college, we had access to a mainframe, but we had to you know, type out our, God, I'm really dating myself here, we had to type out our program on, on, on cards, punch cards, and submit it through a window. And um, you know, they would later come back with a big stack of air uh, bug reports of uh, air, air messages. Um, you know, the fact that you have access to industrial technology doesn't mean that it's easy or that everybody has access. The, the technologies you just described, that AutoCAD, I think the license fee on that is $5,000 a year. You know, those tools, those, those CNC mills you have, they probably cost $100,000. I mean, you're super lucky 
Um, but my school couldn't afford that. Most schools couldn't afford that. The difference now is that, is that that same technology is free. The, uh, the CAD software is free. The CNC mill costs $700, uses a Dremel tool. Um, that we've finally gotten it so it's cheap, easy, and ubiquitous. And now it makes sense to put in the schools because, because it's not a huge hardship on the schools. And it's a, something you can continue to use in your after school without having to kind of get a degree in, in mechanical engineering. We're going to do one last question. Question right here from this lady. Do I the mic? No, if you talk loudly. Okay. Hi, Mary Alice Ball from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So I work a lot on broadband deployment, digital inclusion. Um, you, you're talking about uh, Tijuana and San yeah. Diego. What do you see as the possibilities? You know, the potential of these technologies and maker spaces, how they could might transform rural America. Yeah. Well, um, you know, the, the good news is that, you know, like everything else that the internet touches, it kind of, it, it, it's easily distributed. Um, you don't, you know, the, the first industrial revolution took the cottage industries of the time and sort of, you know, built, um, it took everyone out of the rural world and brought them into the cities. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, actually, I, I, I you know, do I have time to show, show yes. one, quick, one quick slide? It's, it's kind of magical what the industrial revolution did. Um, you know, we, we think it's about, you know, dark satanic mills and all that, but, um, but uh, um, you know, um, by, by, you know, basically um, concentrating industrial power, um, it, it hugely improved quality of life. I and mean, this is what it did to, to life expectancy, and this is what it did to the population in the United Kingdom. And it, um, you know, we think of the, the, you know, the cottages in the rural England as being idyllic and, and you know, and, and and peaceful, but in fact, they had no access to running water. They had you know, poor sanitation, no, no sewers, um, no educate, you know, poor access to education. Uh, the walls were damp, etc. And so those dark satanic mills actually were surrounded by cities that had sewage and water. And, and, and so, so concentrating industrial might around the cities was, was very good to develop us. Um, but we, what we lost in that process was all the variety and character and and um, and uh, you know, um, uh, let's say let's say individual qualities of the cottage industry. But that was necessary because it was all about the machines, and the machines were massive steam powered. You know that, that that stuff I was showing before. What we're now introducing with digital manufacturing is possibly a return to the cottage industry. You know, now it doesn't. You don't have to. Factories don't have to be big. You know, block long Goliaths. You can have you can have um, small prototyping machines on your desktop and then upload it to the cloud. And so, you, and so you can start to imagine a world, and if you look at the Kickstarter, distribution of Kickstarter projects or of Etsy projects, they look like America. Uh, they're, they're fully distributed, and what you realize is that where broadband reaches, where people have desktops, where FedEx can go, there can be manufacturing. And we can come back to the cottage industry without, ha you know, without having um, you know, uh, lost uh, the ability to be global, to be innovative, and to manufacture at scale. So I think this could be I think this could be great for I mean, you say rural I'm not sure whether I would go as far as rural but it would be great for sort of you know you know move manufacturing out of industrial centers you know less about Detroit and more about suburbs and 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 all that and let people live where they want to live and let culture go where it wants to go without having to move to the machines. Chris, thank you so much. I understand you're going to stay and sign books. Yeah. And answer questions as people have them a Absolutely. little bit. Well, thank so, you everybody for for staying. Thank you all very much.